So again, welcome to the webinar Wednesday. On behalf of the board, I'm Tara Mahoney and the Education Committee. We're so grateful that for you for sharing your time with us. And we have a terrific lineup tonight with Suzanne Heisman. Um, HHRF really wants to be able to offer these webinars for free. Um, since we believe sharing information is really key to elevating the entire industry, professionals, as well as the equine welfare piece. So please hit the donate button, $5, $50, $500, every dollar matters. Uh, it means more research. You know, right now we're really excited to have a $50,000 grant available for proposals. Um, we're hoping to have two, three, four, five a year. So we really appreciate you joining us and want to keep offering these for free. So that was my shameless plug. <laughs> really appreciate you, you thinking about us. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Suzanne. So I met Suzanne years ago and um, I've actually been on her property and so impressed with her property and her herd, just lovely, lovely horses. What she has done um, over decades of clinical experience um, to be able to pull trauma and um, her clinical patients into the experience and the healing and the hope that the horses offer. She's currently involved in Horse Speak with Sharon Wilsey. Um, she is a Path International instructor with, um, and you're on the education committee as well, I believe. She's taught hundreds, no, sorry. She's taught, well, you've taught hundreds yeah. and hundreds of, um, you know, hopeful people who are getting involved in the work. Um, recently trained actually my team with the Equine Immersion Project and um, we use your the, the learning that you taught all of us often. Um, she's also a professor at Post University. Um, so we're really excited to hear from you, Zan. Why don't you take it from here? Okay. Well, thank you, Tara. Uh, and welcome to Clippity Clop, the Rhythms and Relationships of Mounted Trauma Processing. Or you could think of it as being riding from reliving to remembering. So many thanks to the Horses and Humans Research Foundation for providing the information sharing opportunities for practitioners. I really appreciate that. And for giving me a chance to provide this talk with you guys. Here's my actual first slide. <laughs> I'm running two computers. So if I, if I get behind on one, I'll, I'll try and catch up. <laughs> I'll try and keep up. But if I seem a little confused, that's why. Um, so I really encourage those of you who are here to go ahead and add something to the chat so we can find out who you are and what you do and um, are there any, uh, are you a therapist or an equine specialist or a volunteer or a researcher or are there any EMDR or brain spotting providers? Have you ever tried doing mounted trauma work? Uh, and while you're doing that, I'll tell you a little bit about me. I'm a licensed clinical mental health counselor and I retired right before COVID hit. Uh, December, end of December 19, 2019, and the timing was impeccable. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I had a very small private practice working with children and adults with trauma experiences that were getting in their way. I'm also a certified equine interaction professional in mental health from the Certifying Board in Equine Interaction Professionals. Um, I'm a PATH, CPRI, and an ESMHL. And I teach the ESMHL workshop. I think that's what Tara was referring to. Um, I've done that for a long time, and um, Mandy Hogan and I teach a little workshop called Beyond ESMHL, and I also taught one for a number of years on the healing nature of horses for mental health professionals and for equine specialists. Uh, right now, I'm really getting into horse speak. I'm certified. Uh, I'm a certified horse speaker, and I do some mentoring for horse speak. People are interested in using horse speak for mental health, and we're hoping to develop some trainings for that probably in 2023. Let's see. Let's see what happens. Um, and Tara mentioned I, I teach for Post University, and I'm the wife of a veteran. I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother, and I'm a dog and a horse caretaker, and I do a lot of stalls. So I muck out a lot of stalls. <laughs> uh, who I'm not, I am not a brain scientist, I'm not a researcher, uh, I'm a practitioner. But I really believe that the research needs to guide our work, and I'm grateful to HHRF for their support of good research in our field. It's really something we so badly needed and I, and I really appreciate how they stepped up and created a whole organization to do that. So I encourage you to support HHRF. We are creatures of rhythm. And life begins in the rhythms of the oceans or life began in the rhythms of the oceans. We're supposed to be sound with this, but I can't get it to work.
We carry rhythm inside, in our heartbeat and in our breathing. So take a minute and find your own breathing rhythm. See if you want to slow it down or speed it up or just let it be. Now, see if you can find your heartbeat, either by taking your pulse, or sometimes I can sort of tune inside and, and I can feel my heart beating. See if you can find your heartbeat. Mine's a little fast, I wonder why. <laughs> Rhythm is a very important part of our lives and our bodies and everything else. There is a rhythm to relationship, <clears throat> a dance of a give and take that you can see between an infant and the mother, an attunement and an attachment where one reads and responds to the cues of the other. These rhythms continue throughout our lives and in all of our relationships in one form or another. Sometimes the rhythms and relationships are aggregate where we're, we are creatures of rhythm and at the same time we're creatures of relationship. Some of these are very moving. Sometimes the rhythms and the relationships coincide. For example, when riding a horse. As a psychotherapist and a therapeutic riding instructor, my inclination was to put people on horseback uh, whenever it made sense to do that. And I had one child who was not named Jim, whose parents were loving and caring, but whose family challenges included a death in the family. It was so overwhelming that they were unable to complete give the care to Jim that he was needing and he really was struggling. He'd been suicidal at one point and he'd been through a ton of therapy. I think he'd been in residential treatment for a while. He had learned to protect himself from the hard parts of therapy by saying, I don't know, whenever I'd ask a question, uh, which I considered to be the great therapy stopper. You can't go anywhere when I get, I don't know. What was interesting to me was that the times that he would actually talk with me about what was happening in his life was when he was riding Tony, my Norwegian Fjord. This happened enough times with Jim and with several other people that I began to wonder and got kind of curious about it. Why could people talk to me about difficult things when riding when they couldn't talk to me about them any other time? Well, finally, I attended a lecture by Bessel van der Kolk, who's one of the big trauma researchers, and he talked about bilateral rhythmic stimulation used in EMDR, which stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. And that was helpful for people who are processing traumatic experiences. And the light finally dawned, and I realized it was the horse's movement that was providing that bilateral rhythmic stimulation that was so soothing to people that they could talk to me about hard things. So I stopped to talk to him about it at the end of the lecture. And I asked if he'd seen horse-assisted therapy, and he said that he had. And when I asked him what he thought, he said, well, the people that provide it, they believe in it. I'm not so sure. And when I told him about my experiences with riding clients, he actually stopped and he went into sort of deep thought. I could see the wheels kind of grinding in his head. And finally he said, you may get some support in my next book. Well, I took that as affirmation and off I went to get training in EMDR. Um, let me go back here. One one. okay, there we go, all right. I'm including a very quick intro to trauma for any of you who are not trauma therapists. And if you are a trauma therapist, you can go take a little nap. It'll be a few minutes here. Uh, the research on trauma is pretty widespread. I, we've learned a lot. Our, and our idea of what the brain, how the brain functions and what it does has changed so dramatically over the last decades. Um, so briefly, what is the trauma response? And it's the perception that survival is in danger, either our own or someone else's. I'm going to read something Peter Levine wrote. Um, he described the trauma response as the byproduct of an instinctively instigated altered state of consciousness. We enter this altered state, let's call it survival mode, when we perceive that our lives are being threatened. If we are overwhelmed by the threat and are unable to successfully defend ourselves, we can become stuck in survival mode. Trauma is carried in the body and in the brain. It's survival stress response and it's actually can be a healthy brain and body trying to cope with a very unhealthy situation. Our bodies focus entirely on survival and all non-essential functions like complex thinking, language, digestion, reproduction, all that stuff shuts down. 
These responses, if they last long enough, are considered post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. The effect is constriction. I'm gonna quote Peter Levine again. Because our bodies do not register that we are now safe, we remain stuck in the past rather than being in the present time, end quote. So how can we help? How does riding help? And how can we focus our riding experiences? According to Bessel van der Kolk, the body keeps a score, quote, the brain is an action organ and, it's, and as it mat matures, it's increasingly characterized by the formation of patterns and schemas geared to promote action. People are physically organized to respond to things that happen to them with actions that change the situation, end quote. But when people are traumatized and can't do anything to stop it or reverse it or correct it, quote, they freeze, explode or engage in irrelevant actions, then to tame their disorganized chaotic physiological systems, they start drinking, taking drugs and engaging in violence like, like the looting and assault that took place after Hurricane Hugo. If they can't reestablish their physical efficacy as a biological organism and recreate a sense of safety, they often develop PTSD, end quote. The brain research has taught us so much about how the brain functions and our understanding of the human brain and the way it works has undergone dramatic upheavals over the last decades, which have greatly changed our approaches to trauma healing. So how can we help people who have experienced debilitating trauma to recover? Our goal in trauma treatment is to help the client integrate their experience into their coherent narrative of themselves and their lives, thereby integrating their past, present, and dreams of the future. They can remember the memories, but they aren't reliving them through the flashbacks, nightmares, numbing, and so on that goes with PTSD. We know we've accomplished the goal when the trauma experience becomes one of many experiences, albeit a horrible one, but it's not the totally dominant experience it was when they first came for treatment. They can describe it without having to relive it, and they can learn from their experiences and go forward. And that's all according to Dan Siebel. There are several hopeful elements for safely processing traumatic memories. Most of them are phase-based. Uh, the client must have some emotional resources and resiliency before they can do the trauma work. Some approaches have different numbers of phases, but basically they all include preparations, processing traumatic experiences, and then building skills that they have missed and building a new picture of their lives. So there's a forward aspect to it as well. Uh, they often include movement, and during processing, the client needs to be able to stay within the window of emotional tolerance. In other words, they, we don't want them to be emotionally overwhelmed by their therapeutic experiences because then we're re-traumatizing and we're not doing them any good at all. We're in fact, making it worse. We want to be surrounded by, we want to surround them with supporters who are attuned and attached. We want to have feelings of safety and grounding the present time. And we'll do short visits into the past around the traumatic memory, but we return to the present before the window of tolerance is breached. So how can writing help here? Here we go, okay. Once clients have moved through the phase of developing inner resources and strength, the mounted work can actually provide many of the elements helpful for the phase of processing traumatic experiences if they're comfortable on the back of a horse. Horses with the strong side-to-side -side movement provide that bilateral rhythmic motion, which helps clients stay within that window of tolerance. It also provides a quick refocusing to the present if needed by changing the motion of the horse. Riding helps the client to stay in the present while considering their past, which also expands the window of tolerance. Interested horses can provide strong relationships with the client that again enhances that sense of, of safety. Coursework can also help the client develop trust in the mental health professional and the therapeutic riding instructor more quickly by seeing them demonstrate care and consideration of the horse. If they are that concerned with the horse's welfare, well, I guess they'll take care of me too. Horses are much more fun than an office chair. <laughs> they give a positive feel to the difficulties of trauma work. They can be actual partners by giving input. Uh, I've been working on horse speak, the body language that horses use to communicate with each other and with us, and their body language can be read and emulated by us, and it, that enhances our communication and attunes the team to what the horse is trying to tell us. 
which allow them to be very active partners. Uh, the client is not required to have riding skills, but uh, comfort on the back of the horse is an absolute necessity. If the client doesn't feel safe on the top of the horse, this approach to therapy will not work at all. I have worked with a lot of non-riders, but we usually took some time to be sure that they could feel safe up there before doing the trauma processing. There are a number of treatment modalities that can be supported by horseback riding, I think, I suspect. Um, Neurosequential model of therapeutics by Bruce Perry uses the developmental approach. Uh, it encourages trauma healing through activities that are rewarding so they can engage the client. The repetitive to help the brain reorganize and the rhythmic. And he likes about 80 beats per minute, which is interestingly enough, pretty close to the horse's walking pace. He encourages bilateral stimulation to help both sides of the brain develop. And he likes attunement and relationship-based work, which sounds a whole lot like riding to me. And there's sensory motor therapy by Pat Ogden, who uses body motions, focus, and awareness to complete acts the body wanted to do during the trauma and afterwards. There's been, uh, somatic experiencing therapy by Peter Levine, and he uses innate healing capacities of the body and the brain to heal from traumatic experiences. And there's brain spotting by David Grand, who, which uses eyes connection to spots in the midbrain to organize the brain to do its own healing work around traumatic events. And mounted work supports this effort, but I'll talk more about that later. And there's mindfulness. This is the focus on the present moment without judgment. More on that later. I'm aware of a number of treatments that use bilateral rhythmic stimulation as well. There's eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, which is a bilateral eye movement. Uh, and I've been an EMDR practice, practitioner for a while, and I've seen some profound changes in people in a short time. And I've been using the bilateral rhythm of writing as my stimulation. I'll talk more about that later as well. Uh, there's emotional freedom therapy, which is tapping on the meridian points. Brain gym, which is not a therapy, it's an educational thing, but it's bilateral movement crossing over the body and used for educational purposes. And there are probably others that I don't even, haven't even heard of. I'm aware, uh, let's see, what, let's change this. Uh, prior to starting mounted trauma processing with any me methodology, there's some preparations that need to be made. Therapists must be well trained in the therapy mode that you're going to use. You need to build a therapy team to wrap the client to include the therapist, the horse professional, and the equine. You need to develop strong relationships with the horse who will work with you. You need to get to know the client's particulars. Everyone needs to be grounded in the present moment. And we need to listen to and communicate with the horse during all parts of the mounted therapy. So I'll take a minute and go over each one of those because they're all pretty important. Whatever method you use, therapists must become very familiar with the treatment modality uh, before trying to do it on horseback. You need to have some pretty in-depth training in that. Um, what we're gonna do tonight will be nowhere near enough training for you to do this work. You need to work it so that you're familiar with the protocols and not grasping for them. Once you add a horse to the picture, things can get pretty complicated pretty fast. It took me about six months before I was comfortable adding uh, a horse to EMDR. Try the modality in the office with the client beforehand if possible to determine if it's helpful for that particular client. Keep the horse professional enough so that he or she can support your efforts. Uh, as much as possible, stick with the research protocols. Um, even though horses movement has not been researched as a bilateral rhythmic stimulation, but adhere as much as you can. You need to build a therapy team. The therapy team can consist of a credentialed mental health professional, a credentialed horse professional, and a solid riding horse. A credentialed mental health professional is required to be present for therapy. It's much preferred to include the horse professional with the mental health training. Um, and it could be a therapy riding instructor with mental health training or an equine specialist in mental health and learning if a therapist is a CTRI. Uh, in the PATH world, the ESMHL does groundwork only. Uh, mounted work requires the presence of a certified therapy riding instructor. 
Having the horse professional available allowed me to focus on the client's responses to the therapy work while the horse professional could focus on the horse and what the horse was telling us. However, there are some clients who can't tolerate having another person present. A mental health professional can do it alone if duly credentialed and if you can keep it safe. So while I am duly credentialed, I would not do it alone with a client who was challenging, like a client who might bail off the horse, for example. The horse professional, while not providing therapy, um, needs to know enough about the goals and methods to support the therapist, the client, and the horse. Work out the roles, uh, communications, and considerations that are necessary for good collaboration. And I encourage you to play together. Uh, people who play well together tend to work well together. The equine needs to be prepared. Um, to do the work and have a voice throughout. This is one of the many advantages of the teams, including a horse professional. Not only was my horse very well supported, but the horse professional could act as a translator. There he could act as a translator, expressing the horse's suggestions and allowing him to be that fully participating member of the team that we'd like to have. Thank you. Okay. It was very helpful to be able to tell the client that we were wrapping him or her with a team that cares and that will work together to keep him safe while working in the difficult memories. The therapist, horse professional, and client should all have a strong relationship with the horse. And be sure that the client is comfortable riding and feels safe up there. I can't say that enough times, so you'll probably hear it again. And that the therapist or the horse professional is comfortable leading a rider on, on, on an assisting horse. First thing we have to do is prepare the riding horse. Um, the riding horse can provide many of the elements helpful to trauma processing and may help people for whom office work is too hard. Horses that are mentors, teachers, or caretakers who like to be ridden would probably find this work the most rewarding. Horses with strong side to side movement are particularly helpful as they provide a stronger bilateral rhythmic motion. Horses can give input. Uh, and here I thank Horse Speak for teaching me so much about that. They can talk about where to go next. Uh, I had a horse that um, would, when I was just figuring this out, I had a horse that would nudge me sometimes or he, he would move my hand or he, he'd push my body a little bit or he changed positions with me. And I finally had dawned on me, he was trying to tell me something. So when I began let him, letting him direct where I wanted to go when he wanted to, then I was, uh, we figured it out, we had a real partnership going on. And the interesting thing was that my client noticed when that happened. I didn't say anything, but she noticed when it happened. Um, the horse can also tell us things that need to happen on, after the ride. Oops, went on. Got ahead of myself. Sorry. There we go. Um, for an example, one day when Sharon Wilsey was my horse professional, she came to my farm for about three months to help me so we could figure this out. Tony, my fjord, helped with a powerful mounted EMDR session. At the end, he wanted the client to do something fun. And to him, it was fun to walk over ground poles. So he wiggled his ears and he directed us to walk over the ground poles. We all had a very good giggle, which was welcome after that session. And then once we went back to the stall, he went to the corner and directed his back towards the client, asking her to have his back. Now, some people think that's threatening, but in, in, with a quiet, calm horse, it, he wasn't being threatening at all. But he also wasn't nervous or wasn't fearful. So it was curious that he was asking us to have his back or asking her to have his back. So Sharon finally figured out that um, he was asking the client if she was okay. He wanted to know if she was okay enough to have his back. And that was how he asked how she was doing. If she could have his back, then she was all right. And it turned out she was. Um, get to know your horse before you ask him to work with your client. Be sure, uh, be sure, uh, I'm sorry, be sure the horse is comfortable with the space uh, where you'll be working that day. For some reason, my computer's not charging. Hold on a sec, I gotta fix this one. Yeah, well, well, the last. Yeah, go ahead, charge your computer. This is amazing. So grateful. So why don't we take a minute and please, everybody start adding questions into the chat. It's a really unique situation that we have for expertise to be able to be available. So start throwing out some questions and 
um, she will save some time at the end to be able to open that up. Thanks, Suzanne. Okay, got I fixed it. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank heavens for those little warning messages we get. <laughs> at least it didn't just die on us. <clears throat> okay, let me start again. Get to know your horse before you ask him, him or her to work with your client. Be sure that the horse is comfortable with the space where you're going to be working on the day of the work. This may vary with the day and the moment. Before bringing on a client, ride and see what his or her preferences are around pack, activities, and so on. Most of the trauma work will be done at the walk, though I have occasionally used a quick trot transition. Practice leading the horse while other people are riding before you, um, uh, I'm sorry, practice leading the horse while other people are in the saddle before you put a client on because it takes a little doing to do that and you want to be comfortable doing it. Figure out how this particular horse communicates with you. Does he nudge your hand in one direction or another? Does he push your back with his nose? I find that if I acknowledge to the horse that I'm getting the message from them and I'm listening, they give me a whole lot more. So the more I listened to this horse, the more he told me. Figure out what give, I'm sorry, what happened there? Oh my goodness, <laughs> sorry about that. Oh. Okay, uh oh, sorry, hang on. I'm gonna stop sharing for just a minute while I figure this out. It's such a great point to get to know your horse. That's the key, right? The horse is the one that will tell us what's going on. So I bet everybody, you know, I see a lot of nods. I see a lot of people really agreeing with that. Um, and you're right, you know, sometimes we think that, you know, um, the work is really about what we might think we know where the horse will tell us so much more about what they know. Suzanne, I love hearing your stories. Thank you. So many, so many years. Awesome. Okay, can you see the uh, PowerPoint? Not right now. You stopped oh, okay. sharing. Okay, because I screen sharing. Okay, I gotta find a way to get back to. All right. Yeah. Got it. All right. Okay. Give me a minute. Sorry about this. I don't know why what happened that did what it did, but that was crazy. They have a mind of their own. Absolutely. <laughs> the real one's got into this one. Now I can't find Zoom. Okay. Oh, I can't find you guys. We still see you. We still hear you. <laughs> <laughs> You're still. Oh, I found it. Okay. Yes. Right. Welcome right. back. <laughs> Great. Like to screen. There you go. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. And then eventually I'm going to get back to my PowerPoint. I can find it. Oh, there it is. That's such a good feeling, right? No. Oh. Not... <laughs> there you go. Yep. Oh, I, I did. Gosh, I screwed up again. Let me go back. It should. Yeah, there you go. Yep. It should give you an option to not share your notes. Okay, so who's young and tech savvy? How do we get the notes out of there? So let's see, I gotta get the glasses on. I don't, I'm not young and tech savvy. Um, so I okay. think you start slide presentation. Okay, I think I got it. Feeling better? Yep. Okay, get to know your heart. So we go. Perfect, well done. So we talked about being comfortable with the space. See what his riding preferences are. Practice leading the horse, figure out, oh, figure out, okay. And then figure out what give back activities the horse likes. I really like to have a client have an opportunity to give back to the horse. Uh, it's a nice way to say thank you. And I think it really helps helps everybody. I think it's good for everybody to do that. So, but not all horses like all things. So you need to figure out what your particular horse likes and appreciates and the give back. I do find that most horses don't like uh, give backs uh, that involve hugging their face. Okay. Uh, next slide. Help the client get to know the horse. Be sure that the client wants to do this kind of work, by the way. I, I had a year where I had a bunch of moms that called me up and said, oh, my kid would love to do your work with your horses. And when I met the kid, the kid wasn't interested in horses at all. They weren't even interested in dogs. 
So I would do something else with those kids, but make sure that you've got clients that really want to do this kind of work. I probably should have had a mom's group going, don't you think? Be sure that the client has the inner resources he needs to stay and do this kind of work. Get to know the client's particulars, learn about their preferences, what feels safe, uh, if anything does. Some clients, nothing feels safe. Uh, you need to know what their triggers and triggered responses are, at least the best you can. Sometimes they show up and you don't know they're there. Uh, and with EMDR and brain spotting, you don't need to know the details about the traumatic experience. So you don't need to know their trauma history. Um, that saves the client having to talk about them. If they can share it, that's fine, but they don't have to. Uh, encourage the relationship to develop. Have the client do some groundwork with the horse before riding. Clients and horses both felt best when there was a real connection between them. Make sure that the client is comfortable in the saddle. Riding skills are not required because they're gonna be led and you're just gonna be walking for the most part. And, uh, but they need to feel safe up there. And if they don't feel safe, this won't work. And after the session, allow the client to give an have an opportunity to do some kind of give back to the horse. I love the, the ground things in mindfulness. Uh -huh. Mindfulness provides opportunities to ground and settle and lay the groundwork for doing trauma work. It encourages an attitude of curiosity and compassion. It focuses on present moment experience. It involves non-judgmental acceptance of feelings and experiences. And research supports the using it for a variety of different uh, clientele, like veterans, women, victims of domestic violence, firefighters, children, and refugees. It also has a promising intervention for treating anxiety and mood problems in clinical populations. And it increases psychological flexibility. It was very helpful when added to other therapies. So that's what I did is I added to the other therapies that I was working with. Can you see a place for mindfulness with horseback riding? Um, because horses live there. And so they kind of like it when, when we meet them there. Oops, I went ahead, let me go back. Um, it's my sense that the sense of safety provided by the relationship with me, my horse professional and my horse, and the bilateral rhythmic stimulation provided by riding allowed my clients to address traumatic issues while riding they were not able to address while sitting in a chair. And while I think that many traumatic processing methodologies could be used with the support of horseback riding, I experimented with the two that I had learned, which were EMDR and brain spotting. And so we'll discuss each of those here. Um, first of all, well, we have to ground in the present moment and in, in the horse's movement. It provides the bilateral rhythmic stimulation that helps clients with their processing work. Once mounted, Help the client focus on the horse's hind end movement uh, so that um, so I could help them focus on that movement. Uh, I generally ask them to, um, to tell me which hind hoof was stepping and I really didn't care if they got it right or not. I just wanted them to notice how their body was shifting with the movement of the horse. Uh, so I didn't care if they had right or left. I just wanted them to focus. Riding can be stimulating as well as soothing, so pay attention so that you can help the client stay within that window of tolerance. Intervene if it looks like he or she is becoming overwhelmed. Once we've prepared everyone involved, the client's ready to take on the processing of the traumatic memories, and we can begin the processing work. So I'm going to start with EMDR. In fact, where I started. Um, it uses the bilateral rhythmic stimulation and other supports to help people stay within their window of tolerance while they work on their traumatic memories. It was developed by Francine Shapiro and has been widely researched for effectiveness. Standard EMDR is phase-based. It uses, uh, begins with ensuring the safety of the client's environment, building the client resources and self-regulation and expanding that window of tolerance, then processing the traumas, installing positives, and working towards accomplishing future dreams. Generally, the client moves the eye focus from side to side while keeping the head still. So it looks kind of like this. But you can use other kinds of bilateral stimulation. Uh, they could be auditory. Uh, people have used um, finger snaps or buzzies or tapping or some kind of physical movement. Side to side eye movement has the widest research backing. Help the client have a dual focus on the present while thinking about the memory. 
Safety is critical. The therapist supports and monitors the client's state to help the client stay within that window of tolerance. We use a dual focus, short visits to remembering the traumatic event with a return to the present before the window of tolerance is breached. And these are all from my trainer, Ricky Greenwald. There are a number of different EMDR protocols for different situations that can be adapted to riding. I pretty much use the basic one. When you add a horse to EMDR, I use the horse's rhythmic movement as a bilateral rhythmic stimulation. And what I liked about it is it worked on all levels uh, of the proprioceptive system at the same time, from the bottom of the spine all the way up to the brain. Walking the horse's movement is around 80 beats per minute, which is the speed that Bruce Perry suggested is a good rate for, of motion to help with trauma work. The feedback I received from my clients was that EMDR and horseback worked way better for them than eye movements, but the client can match the eye movement to the rhythm of the horse's movement if, they, if you want to have them do that. You can vary the tempo and types of movement based on client needs. Trots bring focus quickly back to the present. I had one client who was an experienced rider, but she was starting to slide out of her window of tolerance. So I was able to do a quick trot transition. Tony did a quick trot transition and brought her right back to the present where she felt a whole lot safer. Generally, I use the basic EMDR protocol. You can adapt other EMDR protocols to writing as well. Here's sort of a brief description of how to do it, but this in no way constitutes the training that you need to do this, okay? So first of all, we have to set the required elements before you go in with the horse. I usually would do this in the office before we get out there. These would include the safety object, the safe place, the trauma target memory, the negative and positive cognitions about themselves, the validity of the positive cognition, how true does that positive thought about yourself really feel? Is it completely false or completely true or somewhere in between. Um, the feelings that people had, the by locations of the feelings and the subjective units of distress or the SUD, <clears throat> which usually goes from one of no big feelings to 10, the worst big feelings of all. A, the team member can lead the horse around the arena so that he feels safe and checks out the scary places and reassure him that you're on it. Be sure he or she is calm and comfortable with the space where you're working at the time of the session, because we all know that bees, bears, and boogeymen can appear at any moment. Help the rider mount up, and then help the rider focus on the, hind, the horse's hind end movement. Um, again, I usually just ask them to tell me which, which hoof was moving. Begin with the client's mental safe place. It must be well-established and easy to reach from the trauma memory. The thing we would ask is, uh, is uh, tell me of a place, a place you've been to where nothing bad has ever happened or a place you really love to go to, and it could be real or imaginary. Some clients can't even imagine uh, a safe place. So that was a, a tough one for them. You can ask the client to think about the worst parts of the trauma memory, unless it puts them out of the window of tolerance. And then I would have them go a number of strides. Usually I'd use about 20, but that varied according to client responses. So when we got to the 20, I'd say, and whoa, and the equine professional would stop the horse. Ask what comes up. Listen as the client tells you what comes up. If any interventions are needed, provide them. You could return to the safe place, the safety object, or whatever is needed at the point. And if they're okay, you said, go with that. Um, and when they're ready to continue and have the horse walk on. Notice the nudges, pushes, and responses from the horse. One time, one of my clients was stuck in a memory. She'd gotten to a point she just couldn't get beyond it. And my horse told the horse professional, who was Sharon Wilsey at this point, that we needed to back up. We backed up and then went forward again. And interestingly enough, the client became unstuck. And I think I knew something that I didn't know. Other times, horses have told me when we need to change direction or go faster or slow down or even stop. When they know I'll listen, they have more to say. Continue with the EMDR protocol until the SUD is zero or you run out of time and need to contain the memory. And allow time for the client to give back to the horse. Also, I found with, particularly with kids, um, if they worked really hard, I would, we'd do something fun on the horse. We'd do a trot or we'd do something that they really like to do. So we wanted to build some fun into the, the thing as much as I could. I had a client who told me that when we did EMDR in the office, the memories of her mother's abuse were so traumatizing that she wasn't able to work through them. 
when she could ride my horse, Nikki, she was able to feel the peace of her presence. This is a quote from her. Nikki was there going with me and Suzanne was there keeping me safe. He also had chronic pain, which her doctor thought was trauma related. The pain was greatly eased by the motion of Nikki's walk. We brought mindfulness into it and she became a real pro at mindfulness. And eventually she got off the pain medication she'd been taking for years. Okay. So brain spotting is another trauma uh, processing method that I was that I got some training in. And it was developed by David Grant, who incidentally was a EMDR therapist when he figured this thing out. Um, the quote with brain spotting is that where you look impacts how you feel. And you can try this yourselves if you want to. If you can think of a memory or something that that's, you're worried about or bothered by, I'm gonna use giving this presentation. <laughs> Um, and you put your finger out, uh, you know, out in front of you, and kind of look and look look at it and just follow your finger as it goes around in front of your face, and you'll find a spot where the uh, feelings are the strongest. Mine's right there. I'm gonna go on past it just to make sure. Oh, there's another one right there. So then you go back to the one that's strongest. I think it was this one. You can go up and down. Now, people usually do this with a pointer, not their fingers, but I don't have a pointer with me, so I'm using my finger. Um, and what it does is um, it uses relevant still eye position to access parts of the midbrain and the subcortex, the parts of the brain that control self-regulation and memory processing. Uh, so how does it work? Well, in my training, I learned that there are several connections between the visual systems and the midbrain. There's only one from the pre, uh, prefrontal cortex to the midbrain. So the eyes have a better access to that midbrain than the, uh, the prefrontal cortex. Why talk therapy for own trauma is so difficult. By finding the relevant eye position or spot where the eye looks, the brain and the bodily felt sense of the trauma can be accessed as well. Brain spotting uses auditory input, which randomly shifts from side to side to keep both sides of the brain engaged. It relies on the brain's own healing mechanisms to work. Once the brain is organized around the spot, it will handle the processing itself, which may go on after the session for as long as three days. My job is to hold the space and to keep the client feeling safe. The therapist does not need to know anything about the traumatic event for the client to work on it. And brain spotting helps avoid some of that pain that people have to go through when they talk about um, difficult things. After success we had with EMDR on horseback, I decided, well, why not? Let's try brain spotting on horseback. And it was far better than I anticipated. The auditory input can be kept on a smartphone or an iPod. Uh, David Grant put together a recording whose sound randomly shifts from side to side to keep both sides of the brain engaged. So it, it'll be over here for a while, and then it'll go over here for a while, and it'll be back over here for another while. But these are all randomly spaced so that the brain has to keep active in order to keep track of it. So before mounting, you wanna set up the headphones over and around or under the helmet. You can see in this picture, she's got them over the helmet. Um, and you want the client to be able to hear them, but you don't want them to interfere with helmet safety. If you're using one of the newer phones, by the way, you may need an adapter so that you can use the headphones. Pick whatever auditory input the client prefers for the selection from the selection provided by David Grand. Some of them are nature sounds, the ocean waves, the, the stream sounds and so on. And some of them are music. Some people simply start at the beginning of the whole tape and then play it all the way through. I found that people who were musically inclined tended to be distracted by the musical selections and did better when they had natural sounds. I have done spring spotting without the auditory input, but I think it's more effective when it's going. Leave the auditory input going the whole time, loud enough to be heard by the client, but not so loud that the client can't hear the therapist. Put the phone or other device in the client's pocket with enough cord available so that the headphones are comfortable. Um, lead the horse around the arena in both directions before mounting so that he or she can feel safe and can check out any scary places. Be sure he's calm and comfortable with the space you're working. If there is a scary spot, you might wanna make a note, maybe avoid that, um, avoid leading the horse into that area. 
it's interesting how arenas seem to have their own boogeyman spots, um, at least the ones I've worked in. Have the client mount the horse. And again, check the earphones and so on to be sure that they're still working. Lead or have the horse professional lead the horse around the arena uh, in both directions. And this is a, um, okay. Leader had the horse professional lead the horse around the arena with the client on board. Generally, we would go once or twice around the arena in both directions. And this is a good time to have the client find the horse's kind in movement, uh, movement by again, looking for what, which foot is he picking up now? Help the client find the horse's kind in movement. Find the virtual, the visual spot using the pointer where the client's feelings about the trauma are the strongest. Hold the pointer on that spot for a few minutes while the brain organizes around it. The brain spotting training has hold the pointer in the same spot throughout the entire session. But once you've got a person on a horse, that's really not possible. Um, what I would do is I held it up there for a few minutes till the, it felt like the brain had gotten organized around it. And then I simply pulled it down and we pulled it out if we needed to return to it. Have the horse walk on. You, the horse professional and the horse are there to provide that safe holding space for both the client and the horse. Pay attention to the horse trying to tell you to change direction, location, and so on. One of my clients said she could feel the moment I figured out the horse, what the horse was suggesting. The team felt really solid to her and she felt especially safe. The client's emotional responses will often go in waves, strong in one moment, easier the next. It helps if you've told them about that ahead of time so they don't get too frightened when they become large. Often if they hold out just a little longer, the feelings will recede before they lose the window of tolerance. Stop periodically to check in with the client. If you see strong distress that threatens to erupt before the window, beyond the window of tolerance, stop the horse and come back to the mental safe place. You may need to adjust the brain spot to someplace less stimulating. Brain spotting training offers directions on how to do this, but often if the client can tolerate those feelings, they can make faster progress. Go until the client has finished and doesn't want to squeeze the lemon for more or until the last few minutes of the session. Squeezing the lemon simply refers to getting that last bit out um, of discomfort out of there. At the end of the session, remind the client that their brain will continue to process for about three days and tell them how to get in touch with you if they need to. And once dismounted, allow the client to do give back uh, with the horse for a few minutes. And again, uh, before you get off, you can have the, have the client do some fun riding stuff if you have time. One client wrote the following description of her ride. This experience was so powerful me, for me and I continued with a sense of openness and peace throughout the following days. It amazes me how our brains know what we need to heal. The movement and connection with the horse amplified my ability to silently work through traumatic experiences that have greatly affected my life for the past 30 years. The trust I had in Suzanne and my horse as they facilitated this experience gave me the ability to allow myself to let go. I am grateful and blessed. I look forward to continuing this work with my human and equine partners. And I checked with her a few years later and she's still not bothered by that memory, which was after her for 30 years. I have had clients who did both office and horseback work in both ENDR and brain spug. And their unanimous uh, agreement was that working with the horse was much better. In fact, I'll quote one of them. She says, get your fingers out of my face and get me to that horse. Brain spotting actually, uh, those people who did both EMDR and brain spotting told me that brain spotting let them go a little bit deeper in their trauma healing. And I found that EMDR was especially useful for the one shot traumas. And then I'd use brain spotting for those people who had longer, more complicated histories. But others may have different experiences and that's why we need research. Whatever method you use to process traumatic experiences, our horses showed us that the rhythms and relationships of riding could provide a powerful support for people working through trauma. So in summary, riding impacts many areas of brain function simultaneously. It can be used with a variety of therapeutic interventions. It incorporates attachment and attunement and safe relationships with horses and people. It is very flexible and adaptable to the therapy mode and to a particular client's needs. It provides bilateral stimulation throughout the motion of riding. 
It has a potential for mindfulness to support the healing. It can be used with different therapeutic modalities to enhance the trauma recovery. It can actually be kind of fun and there's just not a whole lot of trauma processing therapies that can claim that. My clients were able to share more coherent narrative of their lives, which is one of the hallmarks of successful trauma work. And part of their life narrative now includes a time when they were rode a horse on the road to healing. So I encourage you to consider adapting whatever methods you use to include mounted work and see where that ride takes you. So now I can take some questions. Oh my gosh, Suzanne. Amazing. I'm so glad this is recorded because I didn't have my notepad and couldn't write fast enough. Really great information. We've got some terrific questions. Um, why don't I read them from the chat and then we can e easily have people open up their mics if they need to. So Carol, awesome question here. Um, when you refer to side to side motion, are you referring to equine pelvic rotation or trunk lateral flexion? Really good detail. Oh, uh, you know more about that than I do. I think I, I was just noticing when, when I ride a horse, I'm feeling this motion of going from side to side and that's what I was using. It's probably a combination of all the above. So some equine pelvic rotation as well as trunk lateral flexion. Yeah. Okay. And are you looking more at the horse or more at the human as they're doing that? Well, that's why it's nice to have a horse professional because I can then look at the client and the horse professional can pay attention to the horse. If sure. I'm doing both of them myself, I have to pay attention to both um, because the horse is talking to me and the client is, is working and I've got to watch and see, make sure that they're within the window of tolerance. So I won't do that with complicated clients. Um, I only do it with clients that I feel like I can keep it safe for. Really good point, right? That's why it takes a team. Yeah. See everything. You know, you, absolutely. So we have another great question here from Carol. Um, can you provide a demonstration of the rhythmic eye mo movement that you're referring to? So, right, yeah. so we're talking a lot about EMDR, but it might be helpful, you know, good websites are out there, videos, but some are not great. So- Yeah, we can do a little quickie here. Mm -hmm. when, I'm an e when I'm doing EMDR in the office, what I would do is I put my fingers up and I have the client follow my fingers with their eyes by keeping their head still. And we just go back and forth like that. So that's how, you, how they do it. Now, what you can do if, if the horse, the client is riding, and sometimes if I'm doing this for myself and I'm riding, what I'll do is I'll, I will let my eyes go back and forth while I'm riding and just go to the side, one side and then to the other and then the other. And I can time that with the movement of the horse's movement if I want to. So I get both of them. And the whole treatment team starts to almost kind of get in that same sync. The yeah. horse, the equine specialist, the mental health, and the client. That's really a fun experience, right? When you all of a sudden, we're all, you know, really yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Cool. Yeah, it is really cool, right? <laughs> all right. We had, we had a, um, a question in the chat box about horse speak. So can you kind of describe it or where do you get certified to let our audience know more about it. Okay, um, horse speak is the language that horses use to talk to each other. And Sharon Wilty um, was really curious about this and she did like decades of observation of horses, horse herds talking to each other. And she also did a deep study of how different trainers work with horses and trying to figure out, okay, what, what works here? And she's an incredible observer. And what she found is that horses talk to each other all the time. If you see horses out grazing yeah. in the field, they're constantly talking about, let's go over here. I'd like to go over there. Will you come with me? I think we have to go over here. I like this over here, you know, whatever. You're too close, please move over. So they're constantly talking with each other. And the cool thing is that when we begin to notice those, what to look for, um, we can listen in on the conversation and then we can emulate a lot of the things that the horses do to talk to each other ourselves. Now our bodies are very different from horse bodies, but they seem to get it. So often I'll use this, my hand is sort of my muzzle and, and we'll, we'll treat the hand as a muzzle. Um, and other, other things that I can do to help calm a horse that are the same gestures that horses make to each other, but I can do them by using my body in a different, slightly different way. And horses seem to get it. So in terms of where to go for training, um, I think I, I, on, there's a resources list that's a little further down. I'll, I'll get to that slide. And I'm, I'm happy to make this PowerPoint available too. 
Uh, but you can go to um, SharonWilsey.com. I think that's what it is. Let me let me check and make sure here. There's a list of resources, and, and that's one of them. Recorded, Suzanne. So absolutely. So this this presentation is now recorded on HHRF. Share it. You know, the more that we share the knowledge and start to get ideas, you know, and and more people can come to you, come to Sharon. That's awesome. Yeah, and I'm happy to make these slides available too if you, anybody wants those. Thank you. Thank you. This, this yeah, is good. Molly. I'm wondering if I can make a comment. Yeah. Go for it, Molly. Hi, Suzanne. You rocked it. It was hey, really. Molly. <laughs> um, and just to comment, Molly, just tell everyone who you are, okay? Oh, I'm Molly DePreco. I am a psychologist in private practice in Minnesota, and I'm on the education committee with HHRF. Um, and I loved your presentation. And I just want to add one comment about the EMDR is um, as you're talking about it, make sure that you have if you're ever gonna do it for yourself or try it, that you have a licensed professional that helps you because it's a very, very powerful modality. Yeah. And even yeah. when Suzanne was moving her hands back and forth, just be mindful to not do that for yourself because it can take you into places in your brain that you don't wanna go. Yeah, thank you, Molly. Super good. Thank you. <laughs> even with my clumsiness. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. You racked it. And I think Suzanne said many times, you know, make sure you have the training, make sure you stay in your scope of practice. This is just more information to get excited about. This is more sharing of, wow, there's a lot of options there. And link up with other professionals, get trained in it, um, you know, find people that are doing the work that Suzanne's doing, learn, share this, you know, keep on learning about it. Um, I would love to have more people try this. I don't know anybody else who does it, a mounted work. This way. So I would love to have more people try it and kind of get feedback on, on how it goes. And eventually, if we can get enough people doing it, we can maybe get some research around it. All right. That'd be great. Got a $50,000 grant open. There you go. <laughs> All right. We've got 28 people on this call. So big tired. So go no. for it. <laughs> Absolutely. But you're right. You know, these are the things that really lead us into the next phase. So thank you so much. I mean, it's just really breakthrough stuff that you're doing, but you're doing it safely and with your time and talent, you know, and with the right people, you know, experts that know to watch the horse and you know what you're doing. So that was really impactful that you kept saying over and over again, make sure you know what you're doing. But I want to inform you that this is an option out there to learn more about. And it's an exciting part of what's next steps in the industry. Suzanne, we've uh, had a lot of people in the chat box say thank you um, tonight, but a lot of them are requesting your slides. So if you want to share those with me, I will put them up on our website um, so that everybody can see them, if that'll help. Or I can also disperse them as well. Okay, super. And you'll tell me how to do that, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> well, this, by the way, this is the resources, and this is Tony Myfjord with his favorite resource. Mm -hmm. Tony is adorable. Yeah. And that's the farm. This is how to get hold of me. And this is Ian. So many thanks uh, for the people and the horses and the researchers that are helping us get better at the work that we do. And this is the final slide for HHRF. And I'm again grateful to HHRF for sponsoring this, these conversations, these webinars, and for all the work that you guys do to make, help make us better clinicians. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate it. And, you know, we're out here trying to help practitioners with research, support them with research. So it's kind of a, a little bit of a circle. Um, so more people can help us uh, get good research and sponsor research, as, um, then we can have that grant, grant it and then help the practitioner. So yeah, we're very grateful and excited about the new exciting things that we're gonna be doing at HHRF. Cool. Are there any other questions? Oh. Any questions? So much. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Testing and thank you so much. Um, oh, you're welcome. To 
leave the webinar. Um, we really appreciate your time and thank you so much. It's available on the YouTube. And again, join us next uh, month, April 13th at 7 p.m. for um, a thought leaders discussion, um, a nice panel with Kathy Young, Lynn Thomas, and Julie Broadway. See y'all next time. Thank you. Bye. Okay. So, so basically, um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the Man of War project and sort of how we got to where we're going, because um, you all, who's going to your conference, will go more into the neuropsych stuff, but I'll give you some background and sort of how it came about, et cetera. Um, but before I start, start I, I just, we always have to say this because we're at Columbia is we don't, I don't have any speaker conflicts or anything um, for this. Um, the Man of War project was funded by a number of different people. It's not a government funded project. It was funded entirely by philanthropy. Although um, New York State Psychiatric Institute where the Columbia Department of Psychiatry is and the Veterans um, Research Center at Columbia did contribute towards it because we're here and we use some of our state time and some of our Columbia time to do it. And I do get royalties from a suicide thing, but it's not really relevant to this presentation. So how did we get here? We are a research department of psychiatry. Um, and although there is clinical work and educational work in our department, but we, we see ourselves as primarily researchers and this is a very unusual project for the Department of Psychiatry at Columbia. And the way we got here is that Ambassador Earl Mack, who'd been ambassador to Finland, um, was our primary funding source, although other people, yeah, we've raised money, we've gotten funding from other places as well. But he was really interested in, um, well, he was a veteran. And, but he's very interested in racehorses. And he had been the head of the New York State Racing Association. He had been involved with the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation, the Jockey Club and everything. And he kept hearing about these equine assisted therapy programs. And a lot of them were being applied to veterans and used for veterans. And he was somewhat concerned about veterans because there's a high rate of suicide. And he was quite friendly with the person who used to be the head of the child psychiatry department, David Schaffer, who is a big was a big suicide expert, and he knew him personally, et cetera. So he came along to David and said, well, what do you think about these equine assisted therapy programs? And frankly, David thought they were ridiculous. He thought it was a ridiculous idea. And <laughs> he was like, what? you know, that's just like not what we do, right? And so I worked with David for like years and years and years. And he came and said, well, what, what do you think of this crew? You know, and I'm like, well, I don't know. I said that maybe it would be fun, you know? <laughs> um, and it's not what I typically do, but it could be pretty interesting. And then, so I, my expertise is like methodology assessment. And so then we went up to Walk Hill Prison and what they have at Walk Hill Prison is the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation has like herds of retired racehorses. And, and they do this in a number of different prisons, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the prisoner, the inmates would take care of the horses. So like instead of like going, I don't know, to a different program, they would, they would take care of the, take horses. Care of the horses. There's a weird echo right now, but maybe I'll clear up. And so we went up and visited the program. We saw the horses. We spoke with the guy who managed the program. And they would teach them some horsemanship. But what he kept saying was how people got a real lot out of doing this. Um, and that he would have people who had anger management problems or were very tense and they just over the course of taking care of the horses they would become much more relaxed and 
And then we spoke to some of them. And actually, it turns out that one of the, the guys I spoke with was a veteran. And he started talking about how he has real anger management problems, but he can't be that way around a horse. And, you know, so we basically drank the Kool-Aid and because it seemed mm -hmm. like it would be sort of an interesting project to do. Mm -hmm. Although I will say that it was, people were very surprised that we were getting involved in this. And so when we thought that we would look at veterans, um, Columbia has a veterans Center Recording in progress. That, that head, that's headed, that's headed that's by Charles Aurier. And so I said, well, we're going to do veterans. Let's go find you all and see what he thinks about it. Because, you know, I wasn't a veteran expert. I'm in child psychiatry. And it turns out that I think the reason David Schaffer asked me about it is because he knew that I'd had a, a horse when I was a kid. And I liked horses. So then we go and we find Yuval, and it turns out Yuval's had horses, and he really likes them. And frankly, he really has horses again as a result of this project. And so he thought, well, this would be pretty cool because, you know, working, it's just like, it's a completely new field. And it was sort of interesting, like, this could be fun. Instead of, like, sitting in my office, we could go out and look at horses, you know. So we thought this could be fun. Like, we didn't have any preconceived notion it would work but we thought well I mean how often does somebody come along and ask you can you look at this and it seems like something would be fun and so that's sort of how we became involved in it and the other reason that you've always interested in it and what I knew in the stuff I've done PTSD um, is that you know a lot of veterans had mental health problems, they have an increased suicide rate, which is why Ms. Matt came, uh, you know, originally. But also PTSD is sort of the signature disorder um, for veterans. It's often comorbid with a lot of other things. Many people who have PTSD and veterans don't have treatment. Part of it is that they can't get treatment. They're not eligible. They're not deemed eligible. But also a lot of them really avoid or dislike the VA. Um, and there's a lot of stigma around getting treatment. And also the treatments that there are, are lacking. I mean, a lot of people, even if you get these evidence-based treatments, they aren't getting better. Um, and so there's a lot of room for improvement in treatments for PTC and frankly, treatments for many mental disorders. So. I mean, it seemed like it would be something that would be interesting and looking at it as an alternative or an adjunctive treatment. Um, and it was something, you know, that obviously we're interested in. We're interested in looking at treatment. So what is it? You know, I think you all know this, that PTSD is a fear-based disorder. Uh, well, that's how we think of it. And basically, as it's defined by DSM-5, you have to experience or witness some sort of traumatic event. So you have to have exposure to something awful. Um, and you have to have symptoms in different areas and <laughs> different algorithm for how you put it together. But one is like re-experiencing <laughs> it. One is avoiding- Thank you for that. Thank you for that. This is a weird echo. Uh, one is negative alteration. Yeah, I'm pretty sure everybody has their cells on mute. We're seeing a lot of, you know, movement and hearing some background stuff. So sorry to interrupt you, Dr. Fisher. If everybody could just double check that they are on mute, that'd be really helpful. Thanks. There's a bunch of echoes. Okay. Great. <laughs> and then the hyper arousal, the sort of a hyper vigilance, and you have to have significant impairment because most DSM disorders, you have to significant impairment. But in terms of it official recognition, it wasn't really recognized as a disorder in the diagnostic system, although it until Vietnam, it had been around and you would hear shell shock, battle fatigue, combat nerve. So there were people who had what we would probably call PTSD in all these wars, right? But it wasn't until after Vietnam that it ended up in the in the in the classification system, and that's it. so. Here's some old photos of 
people with you know the thousand yard stare you know they look like they 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 haven't so it wasn't until 1973 that bob spitzer put it in the dsm3 and that's when it started becoming recognized and the thing is that um originally it came in because of you know with veterans but now of course it's been expanded to apply to other kinds of traumas etc um so there's him so basically so how does P ptsd treated so generally the best treatment the best research treatment is some sort of exposure therapy where um you sort of you end up exposing the person to what they fear and you do it either by imagining it happening happening again, talking about it, or putting them in a situation where they feel the same way. And so given that one of the um, symptoms of PTSD is avoidance, you know, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a, it's a tough treatment for, you know, for many people. And it's effective for most people in civilian samples. Um, who have this single horrible thing that happens, you can do exposure. But for military veterans, it's less effective. But the real problem is that most people drop out of treatment. You know, people that finish the treatment, it's too challenging, it's too upsetting. Um, and But there isn't a lot of uh, evidence for a lot of alternative treatments for PTSD through the VA, now there's some D EMDR stuff, there's other, but there's a lot of room for alternative treatments. And so our, so from 2014, we say 2015, but it was really 2014 that Mr. Mack first came. Um, our initial goal was to establish the efficacy and effectiveness of equine assisted therapy for PTSD. So it sounds pretty straightforward. Let's look at how EAP works. And what we found, well, first of all, we didn't know anything about EAT. You know, we don't do EAT. So we spent like a while on our own education going to, we did web searches. We looked at the scientific literature. People would send us books about it. There's a lot of sort of popular press books. Um, we visited some programs, saw what they were doing. Um, we had lots of conversations with people. I went to the Agala conference in 2015 to see what that was about. And frankly, that's when I met Jody. And I, Deborah, I'm not sure if I met you at that conference or not. Maybe. Um, so the first thing was like our own education. And what we learned was that there are a lot of programs who are doing some sort of equine assistive therapy. Now, I think people are calling equine assisted psychotherapy. Um, a lot of the programs that are out there struck us as more like sort of wellness programs that they didn't seem like mental health, like mental health programs. Many of them were sort of or wellness coaching type programs. Many are like one at that time were really like one shot type programs like Saratoga Warhorse was like where you go for a weekend, you do something like that. Um, they're most of them are very experiential, which makes sense given that you're doing things with horses, but they vary really widely and what was done, who did it, what the program was. There were a lot of really positive claims being made, um, but there wasn't really any standard way of saying if we're going to investigate um, this equine assisted therapy work, there's no, what are we investigating? Like, what do we even mean by equine assisted therapy? There's no well defined way of doing it. Um, and the state of the research was pretty critical. There's a big article that came out in 2014 15 that Ray's really upset about. Um, and basically said that you shouldn't pay for something that has no evidence base. Um, it wasn't saying that it didn't work. It said that the research was lacking that supported it. Um, a lot of studies are very flawed and that they have very small samples. They didn't follow people up. They didn't have good measures. And again, that there's no set manualized treatment. So when you're asking somebody like the VA or insurance to me to pay for it, what are they paying for? Like, what are you telling them they're paying for? 
not that it doesn't work. It's just that there wasn't an evidence base to support it. And so our initial tasks were to set up a research team, because that's what we do here. We set up research teams. We got lots of input from faculty and colleagues about what we should do. Um, and scorn to a certain extent, not entirely, but people are like, what are you doing? Um, make decisions about the treatment and design a study protocol. And that's, we have a team. So as you've all may, and then we had invited John Markowitz who had done a study on IPT for PTSD. Um, and he does treatment manuals, he's a big IPT person. We had methodologists, we had Ari Lowell who does a lot of treatment, clinical stuff. We had research staff, we had consultants. And then later the Bergen Equestrian Center and treatment teams, which was a happenstance thing and that it's 15 minutes from our office. We were looking for a site and then we ran into a team who, who, who uh, were a lot of collaboration with us. So our first decisions right off the bat and part of this has to do even before we were educated about it was no riding. We are not riding instructors. And we're like, we're not equine therapists either at that point, but we knew we weren't riding instructors, but we were also very concerned. And part of this has to do with being in New York state. We we're very concerned about safety. You know, having somebody fall off a horse, um, injuries, our institutional review board, there's no way they would go for us doing a riding program. But also as we learned more about it, um, and our own experience is that in the, your nature of your relationship with the horse is quite different when you're riding it than when you're standing next to it. And most of the riding programs that we actually saw were for physical benefits. The movement of the horse, you know, a lot of them are physical. And it seemed to us from what we saw where you would call it like equine assisted therapy or now psychotherapy they were mostly ground based type things so that so we're going to go with that the other thing we thought is it would have to be a group treatment um that would be prohibitively expensive otherwise also veterans are often treated in groups um you can take advantage of a group atmosphere um uh, it's sort of it's sort of nice not to be directly focused just on the person and this kind of thing we wanted to have weekly sessions, like instead of a one shot program to have like something like most psychotherapy programs, you get like once a week, then you think about it, you're still in your own life. And then you, you, so we wanted it to look like regular psychotherapy programs. Um, then the question was, well, how many weeks, right? So how long should it be? Um, we wanted to stay within the Agala model as we had understood it at the time. Okay, we weren't a gala people, as it turns out, most, uh, I think the whole treatment team was a gala certified, but we wanted to stay because the model made sense. And that's basically on the ground, that solution oriented, this is what it was in 2014, 2015, it might have changed a little bit. We like the team approach where you have a licensed mental health professional and equine person. Um, because we decided, which I should put in the other slide, that we were going to aim it at PTSD and veterans. And PTSD is a serious, you know, problem. And we thought it, we need to have a licensed mental health professional. We'd like that you have to have a code of ethics. Um, and currently we're doing something with PATH as well. Um, but so that's what we were doing, team approach, on the ground, experiential ethics. So we thought we thought we fit into it. Um, so, and then we had designed the study protocol. So one of the things was what was the length of the treatment? And there's a lot of discussion about that. We came up with eight weeks. Why eight weeks? A lot of psychotherapies are eight to 12, 16 weeks. <coughs> We were dealing with veterans and we were worried about recruitment and we were worried about cost. And so eight weeks seemed reasonable. Um, we thought a lot about patient safety contingencies, where we're going to be, the equine centers. We did all that. 
and this is where we were at Bergen Equestrian. Um, some nice pictures. Um, then on the protocol itself, um, originally we thought we would do a randomized control trial because that's what you want to do. You know, to prove something, give something an evidence base, that's what you want to have. But there, there are two problems. First of all, what would, what would the appropriate control be? I mean, you can think of a lot of different ways. It, it, at one point, we thought about horticulture therapy, which is actually a whole new area that we would have had to do a manual for, which would answer, is it the horse or is it the setting? Is it the bucolic environment or is it the horse? And so, I mean, you know, those are the kinds of conversations we like having because we think about methodology all the time. But um, when it came down to it, generally, when people are testing new treatment, we were going to come up with a new manualized treatment. You do an open trial before you do a randomized controlled trial because you want to make sure you have a signal that that justifies spending that amount of money frankly right and, and a randomized controlled trial is at least twice as expensive as doing an open trial um so our decision was to start with an open trial in the same way most intervention research proceeds and then we had to manualize the treatment and why do you do that? Because you want to define what is your treatment? What are you testing? It will allow for later training of therapists. You can look at testing specific things about the treatment. So what our treatment is, it's experiential within a larger structure. Um, and we wrote a manual um, with a lot of help. Um, and then the therapist, you know how how to build this. I'll skip that. So who who so who was our treatment team? So we had equine specialists and Jody um, was one of the equine specialists. Um, and then we had mental health professionals. We had two different teams. One was typically made up of Deborah and Jody, and the other one of Bonnie and either Sue and later April. And then we had a horse wrangler. And a lot of people, I think the past people called a horse handler. We call it a horse wrangler. I think part of that is, has to do with ge geography. Because we had gone and seen Alan Hamilton's program and he called it wrangler. And I was just in Montana and I was at a barn and they were calling themselves wranglers. So I think it's a Western thing. <laughs> it's a funny term to us, but we call it a horse wrangler. And then we had a bunch of horse, we had horses um, from uh, um, Bergen Equestrian Center. And now this is it's preaching to the choir, I know, but we do give an explanation of why horses, why are horses good for PTSD. Um, and I have now drunk the Kool-Aid. Um, first of all, in fact, it's so funny because everybody says the same stuff, right? Um, if you go to any of these programs, they all explain it the same way. They might use slightly different language because um, it's a prey animal. Um, and so they're sort of naturally hypervigilant, similar to people with PTSD. It's they're social, they're herd animal. They're very in the present, the moment. Sometimes you can say it, they're very forgiving. Um, they don't hold a grudge and they're big, right? They're large. Um, they can induce sort of a slight fear response because you're not quite sure. Um, and so, you know, there are a lot of reasons why horses would be particularly good for this. And on the other hand, I wouldn't say every horse is particularly good for this, but horses can be, can be good for this. And so basically the, the, the mental health professional and the equine specialist work together in, in terms of dealing with the patient and having interactions with the horse. And um, it's pretty, um, it's pretty amazing, frankly. Um, so I talked about why you want to manualize it, but as I said, we did make these decisions. We decided we would do 90 minute sessions because often group sessions are a little bit longer. And only to do an hour getting people in and out didn't seem to make sense. I said eight weeks. 
they progress from session to session, unlike um, some of the programs we saw um, where the horse is completely at liberty all the time. Our program is slow, much slower than that. And we took into account the fact that we're dealing with people with PTSD who might not feel comfortable going into an arena with a horse running around. So it's a very gradual thing. You start out with observing, then you're touching, et cetera. And every session sort of builds on the session um, before it. We started out with a draft outline on how it might look. We had gotten some um, advice from Alan, Alan Jane Hamilton, as well as from the, the people on the treatment team. And we came up with a draft outline. And then we did sort of mock sessions to see what it would really look like. You know, you can talk all you want, but when you get in and start doing stuff, you see what it really looks like. And they tried out different, dip, you know, different elements. And then, and it was an iterative process. I mean, we had all these meetings with the consultants and the, the, the F-line people and the PTSD um, people. And we found the consultant sort of knew a lot about horses and therapy, not as much about PTSD. The F-line team was pretty unhappy with some of the therapy that was being recommended by some of the consultants at who uh, some of our consultants are very suspicious of the idea that EAT was in the therapy. Um, so there was a little tension there at times. And then we just sort of pushed it up along. And so there was a lot of back and forth meetings, phone calls, et cetera. And we came up with something that looked pretty complete, but not complete, complete. We were sort of finishing as we were doing the group. And we tested it out on two groups of veterans. And then what we learned from that was some of the things we thought would be good were not good. Like just didn't look good when you actually did them with real patients and real veterans, real participants. Um, and so based on the pilot study, um, we made some changes. Um, in terms of the order, there was this thing we call the trust walk that just really didn't work. Um, and then we did a big open trial. Um, and now we're sort of, we've trained some other people and we're continuing to train people. So what does it look like? Um, first of all, it all takes place in a round pen. Some programs that you see that are doing EAT, they're in big open fields, and big open spaces, but this takes place in a round pen and um, it's a group, a, a group therapy. So if you think of the round pen as like a, a, an office or small conference room where you would have a group as opposed to an auditorium where you have a group where everybody's floating around. So it sort of contains the treatment. Um, eight 90 minute weekly sessions. I told you about the team. The first session is unlike the other sessions in that they aren't really in the round pen for the whole session. They're in it only for the end of it. And that covers a lot of psychoeducation about PTSD, about why F1 therapy might work. You give them a sort of a tour or walk around the facility. You have them observe horses. It gives the the mental health professional and, and, and the F1 specialist in a way to get an idea of who the people are in the group, right? They also, you have a thing where people introduce themselves to each other, et cetera. Um, and then at the end of that, you come in and you meet the two horses. They're gonna be the two horses for, you know, um, for, for the protocol. And then, um, then you, Every other session starts in the in the round pen where you have an opening circle. We do a check-in and grounding, have some exercises in the middle, and then have a closing circle. We do some processing and talk about what's going to happen the next week. Um, in the final session, you do some sort of graduation thing. So what we do is we give them like a horseshoe to take back with them, and we give them like you give them a certificate and pictures of the horse and stuff like that. So this slide sort of lays out what happens session by session. So there's session one, which is by itself, and then some early phase, middle phase, and final graduation. 
so we wrote so here's an example of a session so this would be session two session two is actually the more di the most difficult session they do because nobody knows what's going on and you know your horses and people and nobody's really used to it yet and watching that session is the one where it just seems the most chaotic in a way but then it's fine but i i think jody and deborah would probably agree with me on session two um and that's where you're sort of establishing the framework how this works where you're standing where they're standing um and there's just a lot going on so what we did is we sort of outlined the tasks to be done and you know it doesn't well maybe they, they're sort of like horsemanship type tasks it doesn't really matter if they do it correctly it's like how they're doing it and we sort of so what's the focus of this where in the manual like where might you run into some problems some discussion about how to talk about it, et cetera and of course like if you're lead walking for 15 minutes rather than 10 minutes it doesn't really matter but these are sort of suggested times to make it through the session and then sometimes like there is a grooming thing where you're going to clean the horse's feet and you didn't get to it it doesn't matter you can do it in the next session it's not they're not like written in stone and then like this is a later session which session six you know you have other things that you're doing now as i was saying about the horse that you can see i'm a little tired because i just taught my first class at smith so i'm completely keep for you know forgetting where i am um it's not until session six in this in this protocol that a horse is ever at liberty um and that's only for part of the session it's not for the whole session but basically you're sort of building up to it so i think for the people who are doing it like the participants the the veterans um and even for me when i was because i've watched most of the groups you know, the first couple of sessions, it just seems like there's a lot going on. If you've watched 16 groups, which I have, it's like, oh my God, are they ever gonna get to the horse? But it's like, you know, but I'm not the person who's experiencing the treatment, you know? So it's a different experience if, if, you, watch, if you watch them all. But it's sort of outlined and sort of what you can do. And then we tell you what, what's the equipment you need, this and that, so people are ready to go. So you're in there the whole um, 90 minutes. And of course, like, you know, it um, benefits from sort of the common factors that have been shown to help um, psychotherapy work, which are you have some sort of effective arousal, they feel understood by the therapist, there's a framework you give them for understanding what's going on, they have professional expertise, there's a procedure, um, there's a lot of optimism, and they have a successful experience. So these are things that a lot of psychotherapy research has pulled out that are like sort of the common factors and it does include the common factors and how is it different than other ptsd treatments first of all there's no exposure we do not talk about the trauma what the what the participants know is that every this is a treatment for people who have ptsd but we're not going to make you talk about what happened. And indeed, sometimes when we're doing the psychoeducation, explaining what the treatment is, et cetera, we, they, often somebody will say, we're not gonna talk about the trauma, right? And we say, no, we're not gonna talk about it. So, I mean, you talk about it to the extent that you're determining that they have PTSD and you know what the trauma is, but it is not the focus of the treatment. And because of that, you can have people in the same group with very different traumas, very different experiences. What they have in common is that they have PTSD, right? And so and you don't get into this thing, well, I don't know, do, should, you know, that guy's much worse off than I am, or you don't get into a lot of discussion about the trauma. Um, and you just, right? I mean, and, and I think Deborah can back me up on that. And so what you basically are doing is through engagement with the horses, 
your learning stuff about being aware of your emotions, how to regulate yourself because you can feel nervous and you can see that it dissipates. Um, problem solving, communicating clearly, self-confidence, self-efficacy. So those are the kinds of things that, that they're learning that can have an impact on their symptoms. So we had written up this, uh, and you can get it from our website, uh, the thing about the manual and how, and how we developed it that was in military medicine. Now uh, there's Chuck. Um, so then we did an open trial after that because we thought, oh, we correct the manual. And basically what we did is we took veterans who are 18 to 70. These are the inclusion criteria. They had to be in the military, military service. People say, well, how do you know they're in the military? Well, they told us they're in the military. We didn't make them bring in papers and prove it. Um, they had to be fluent in English because we don't speak another language. It would probably work in another language. And in fact, the group in Israel is going to do it. But, you know, we are a treatment team that speak, spoke English. That they had to have a diagnosis of current PTSD at a moderate level. And so they had a clinical evaluation at, at Psychiatric Institute. They met. You know, we used the skid and the caps and everything. Um, we allowed them to be in ongoing treatment, but they still had to have moderate PTSD. So it was treatment that was, they weren't better. Um, and But if they were in treatment, they had to agree not to change treatment during the courses. They had to be in steady treatment. Um, they couldn't be severely like catatonic from depression or suicide or really suicidal because they needed a higher level of care. So, right. So not that they couldn't have some depression, like moderate depression or some suicide, but they couldn't be where we were concerned that they should, we should switch them to a different thing. Um, they had to be physically able enough. Um, you know, so they had to be able to like walk around, you know, so you're standing up. Um, we did have, I think, three people who had canes that they used some of the time. And when people were standing for a long time, they would bring a chair and let them sit down, take a rest. Um, but they had to, for the most part, be mobile. Um, and they couldn't have active out of control substance use because you can't have people who are high around horses. Um, and they could participate in a group treatment. That they were judged to be somebody who could be in a group, right? Like they weren't completely psychotic. They were stable enough. And, and they had to be cognitively aware. In fact, there was one person who was in the treatment who had traumatic brain injury, um, who really wanted to do it. And we let him in. And that was actually a mistake because he took too much time of the group. Like he wasn't participating in a group treatment somebody. He was too impaired. Um, but you know, once you're in, you're in. So physical health restrictions, if they're completely psychotic, it's just, it's the opposite of the inclusion criteria. Or they're really allergic to horses. There was one person who was somewhat allergic, but like he took Claritin or something. So we, of course, because we're a university or actually a lot of research, any, any place that gets federal funding, you, we have an institutional review board that regulates what you're doing. They're very concerned with patient safety, burden, confidentiality. Um, before you enroll anybody, you have to go through this and you have to spell out every single part of the study. Um, and, you know, if you do something different, it's a protocol violation, it needs to be reported, you know, et cetera, you keep track of that. They had to approve every piece of recruitment materials. They, they, they wanted to make sure that our informed consent was truly informed. It, I, I, they were a bit nervous about equine therapy, frankly. And so they sat in on, we had monitored um, the informed consent for a while. Um, so we would be explaining the study and they would sit there and say, well, would you tell them how dangerous it could be? Yeah. So you had to explain every single problem that anybody could ever have. Um, and it's also, it's a new enter in the, you know, also because it was a new intervention, these are people with a serious illness, et cetera, et cetera. So we had a lot of monitoring. Um, and every time you wanted to make an exception, 
Like there was one person who just met the cutoff for severe depression by one point. We had to go and go to the IRB and said, this guy, but we really think he can do it. Da, da, da. And you have to get an exemption from your IRB to do anything like that. Um, so the protocol basically was that obviously you assess people before they go into treatment. Then you assess them at midpoint, which was after week four. Then you assess them at the end, which is after week eight. And then you do, we assess them again three months later to see if they, they hung on to the benefit. And the assessments were all done by people who were not involved in the treatment. Because, you know, if you have the clinician involved in the treatment doing the assessments, well, they want to feel like they're doing better. So you, we had people who are trained to a certain reliability level, even though it was an open trial and they weren't blind to it. They just didn't have real involvement in whether people got well. And we also uh, paid the, for the assessment. So you can't pay people to be treated but you can pay them to come in for an extra assessment. So the assessments were done at our offices and the treatment took place at Bergen Equestrian Center. And then later on in the study, if people would agree, and if they were eligible for MRI, we had MRIs before and after, and they got additional compensation for it because that was yet another visit to a different center to get an MRI. Now, some people weren't eligible for the MRI because they had a lot of tattoos or they had metal in their body. Whereas you can have an MRI if you're like, if, if, if it's for a medical problem for your benefit, like you can have a tattoo and have an MRI and then you'll be carefully monitored because a lot of tattoos have lead and metal in them. Um, but not for a research study. It has no benefit to the person. So like some of our veterans couldn't have MRIs because they had tattoos, significant homemade tattoos, so stuff like that. Um, and one of them, the machine, the machine was not, the, the size of the MRI wasn't, did, couldn't accommodate this person. Um, we provided transportation if they needed it, um, which is something to think about, especially with veterans. Um, and also, as part of being in a research study, I mean, a research study, it's, you know, it's funny because you really, um, it's interesting because later we were training people from PATH, um, and we realized, like, we have very few people drop out or anything because we really, in terms of doing an informed consent, we are very clear about what it meant to be in the study. That is, this is an eight week protocol. You really need to come every week. How are you gonna get here? You know, so we made, it was like a really practical approach because in a research study, you don't wanna get somebody in who doesn't really wanna do it, right? Cause they're gonna, you know, so you, you're really clear from the very beginning. And I think that, I mean, nobody dropped out. I mean, people do drop out of research studies. Um, but you know, we were very careful about explaining what it was, what they should expect. Um, part of that is because of the IRB is, was very, we had to do that. But also I think just in terms of when you use this kind of protocol or this, this kind of approach to treatment generally, you should be really clear. Like you don't want somebody to start any kind of group if they are not clear that they wanna do a group, right? because you have a group dynamic going on. So you, you should clearly explain what the expectations are before you enroll people in any kind of structured protocol. Um, the MRI component was done to better explain um, the therapeutic benefit without, in a way, because an MRI is done by a machine, it, it, it can be seen as more objective. So we, so, so we introduced that. So we were looking at both structural and functional. And you've also going to go into this a lot when he does his thing at your conference. So um, the, the MRI thing was, was pretty interesting, but I'm going to let him do that part. But there's our MRI machine. Um, so, so basically, so what happened in the open trial? So we got 60, first of all, we screened 186 people. 
who called up and saying that they've been, you know, they might have PTSD and they're interested in the study. Of those, a lot of them didn't meet just the inclusion criteria right off the bat. Um, either on a screen they didn't really have PTSD or they were suicidal or they were whatever. Um, so a lot of people got excluded. And then we had 97 people actually come in and go through a full screening, a full clinical interview to see if they were eligible. And of those, 34 of them weren't eligible once they had seen a clinician. And so the, the people who actually entered the study, there were 63 people. And only five of them didn't finish the protocol which is sort of unheard of, frankly. And then some of them didn't get followed three months later because we couldn't find them three months later. But only five people didn't finish the protocol, which is pretty amazing, frankly. And so this is a paper that just came out. So we had a low rate of dropouts. And at, frankly, one of the dropouts never even started the protocol. I mean, so and when you're doing a research study, once somebody has signed a consent form, even if they never get the treatment, they're considered a case, right? And so really it wasn't five people drop out, four. I mean, he didn't get even, he smashed his hand in a, like his car. Or something. I mean, he couldn't, he, something happened so he can participate. And so basically the, you know, the good news was that people really liked the treatment. Um, and we didn't have any study related in injuries. Nobody got worse. Um, we had, I think 37%, nearly 40% women. Um, we had 16 different groups. So the groups are three to four people in a group, usually four, I think maybe one group had five. Um, and only one of the groups is a male, pure male group. The rest of them had males and females in them. Um, they had very mixed traumas. The other thing I should say about the trauma, we did not require that it had to be a battleground trauma. You know, they could be, tra they, their trauma that got them to get PTSD could be, it could have been a childhood trauma. It could have been something that happened after they were out of the military. We saw um, a lot of military sexual abuse as men and women. Um, and what we found that there's a significant decrease in PTSD and depression symptoms for most of the people by the end. So this is all these different ways of using it. One's called an intent to treat model. One's called everybody who made it to the end. And you said there are different ways, but they all show the same thing. That basically the first, the caps in the PCL are the PTSD measures, the HAMD and the BDI, or the um, depression measures. And this is all in the article if you want to look at it in detail. But, you know, basically everybody, you know, the groups improved. Um, and so, so basically it's, it's potentially safe, well tolerated, a large effect size and standard ratings. The treatment benefits were across all the outcome measures. They largely persisted in, in, for three months. Um, 51 and 54% of veterans demonstrated clinically significant change at post-treatment and follow-up. So 51% at post-treatment and 40, 54% and clinically significant was predefined, but most of them improved somewhat. 46% um, below the cutoff score at post-treatment, right? And so our next, so we were happy. We were pretty happy. We were surprised. We were looking for a signal. We think we found a signal. Um, we think it would warrant um, doing a randomized controlled trial. Um, and basically, I don't think the randomized controlled trial actually has to be in veterans with PTSD. I think it could just be in people with PTSD. Um, and so, because the thing is, you really sort of want to have, when you're doing these kinds of trials, you really want to have people who are symptomatic enough that you can see change. Like if people are just sort of sub- you know, you can't, you can't 
see the change as well. So we, we want people to be moderately uh, happy with PTSD, at least a moderate level to do a randomized control trial, but we don't think you would have to confine it to veterans. Now, the thing about recruitment, and you know, we were lucky because we have funding to do it. Recruitment was, you know, once you get people and you recruited them, it was fine. Like nobody dropped out. Recruiting was a whole thing by itself. I mean, it's so funny because you say, oh, you know, equine therapy for veterans. Aren't there a lot of veterans with PTSD? Wouldn't this be great? Yeah, we all think it's great until you start getting them for a study. Um, it's a hard to reach population. People with PTSD are hard to reach population, especially veterans with PTSD. We had open houses. We had four open houses for providers, referral sources, and community. And actually, I'll tell you something funny. One of the open houses, you know, our IRB was so worried about being safe. The only thing that ever happened to anybody where they were at least hurt at all was at an open house for a provider where she stuck her hand in the horse's mouth and it bit her. Nothing like that ever happened in the treatment thing. We had stakeholder meetings. We had meetings at VA, vet center organizations, disabled veterans groups. We sent out flyers all the time. We hung them up all over New York City. We went to vet events. We got in touch with unions and firefighters and transit workers, you know, things where veterans might get employed. We did a lot of presentations. We had a lot of media because um, Ambassador Mack was into having media. We had a website, we had Facebook, but still it took quite a while to um, recruit. And also because we were doing a group intervention, right? So now I had to recruit, we had to recruit people who could commit to be someplace eight weeks, the same time of the week, you know, et cetera. Um, and we didn't have a connection with the VA. Like we're our own vet center. Like to do this going forward, you would want to do much more. You might, it'd be easier to do it if you were actually at a VA. Um, and veterans with PTSD as a group have really complicated lives. Um, lots of medical issues, lots of appointments. Um, many have legal cases going on, issues with, you know, their families. They're much more likely to have housing issues. We have a couple of veterans who are homeless. They can have work-related issues. Like if I need to go to a doctor's appointment, I can just go to a doctor's appointment. Sometimes they can't go to a point. They can't change their schedule. Um, they can have difficulty traveling. Uh, we, our offices are in New York City. Um, we have a GW bridge. You know, you have to take a subway to get to our office. Um, if you have PTSD, often you don't like being in crowded places like the subways. And so we had this one person who would ride his bike. We do have a bike rack. And I would, uh, he, I think our group was Tuesday mornings. And on Monday nights, I was like looking at the weather to wonder if he could get to our office. Because once he was here, we could give him transportation. So um, some people, um, one group we had was at, at night in the evening, we had a morning group and an evening group. And some veterans didn't want to go to the evening group because they don't like to be out with the daughter. So there is a so there's it could be a difficulty with that. And then for the MRI, often they have metal in their body. Our one we had an advantage in that because we are at Psychiatric Institute with a connection to the Military Family Wellness Center, we could offer free treatment services. So at the end, like sometimes people would um, have the EAT PTSD and they want to go on and get other treatment. We could offer free treatment to them. Um, our veteran center supported a full-time outreach person. And we were lucky because we had expert assessment and supervision through the veteran center. One of the things that people liked about this was when you're doing a research study of the university faculty, we, we could assure confidentiality. You know, people are very suspicious of a VA and if things are going to be confidential. And, you know, a research study in a university is all about confidentiality. 
Um, so we had those advantages, but still it was difficult. So what is it? It's a group treatment. You don't address traumatic experiences. And of course, there's a growing body of literature, sent by John Markowitz, who demonstrated that um, doing exercises where you have to keep reciting your traumatic experiences is not always a critical component of recovery. It's specified, it's manualized, we define roles for what they're doing, so it's structured, but it's still experiential. Uh, the sessions are progressive. And the structure and activities were chosen, keeping that people have PTSD in mind. And how does it differ from other equine programs or protocols? First of all, with the manual. Um, so the, although there is flexibility, but there is some fid fidelity that you have to do, that we use comprehensive assessments to track progress. Um, even, you know, in day-to-day -day stuff doing equine therapy, Perhaps you don't have to be as comprehensive as we were, but it is. I do think it's important to to um, track progress to see what you're doing. Um, also, I also think it's important because what happens with equine assisted psychotherapy or therapy is that people will think they're getting psychotherapy, right? And so, because I'm getting this, I'm not getting something else. So if, if they aren't getting something that you know or there's some indication it might work, then they shouldn't, you know, maybe they should go get something else. Like, I just remember from my um, dissertation, totally different topic, but it had to do with parents who, whose children had, had died by suicide. And a lot of them, you know, we were doing family saying we were doing all these assessments, and a lot of them had significant mental illness. Not surprisingly, but, and they weren't going for treatment because they were going to bereavement group that was not necessarily led by any kind of professional and they didn't look well. I mean, I was seeing them a couple of years after their child died. They should have been referred, I think, by the person leading the group to some other kind of help. So I think often, even with these um, alternative treatments, I think it's important if you're treating somebody who has a significant psychiatric or mental health problem to have a, have a, have a licensed mental health professional who can monitor that and know what to do if the person's getting worse or it's going on. So I, I, I just think it's really important to, to have this team approach uh, and track how people are doing. Um, the observations that I was really pleased about, my, my, the thing I was most pleased about was that we had two different treatment teams and they look really different. Like they didn't watch each other, but I watched them both. And they, they operate very differently. Like, one, the mental health person is a lot more talkative and the F1 person is less talkative and the reverse for the other one. And stylistically, they were just different, but they both had similar results. So even though you've spelt out this sort of protocol and this way to do it, there is some flexibility in how you implement. I mean, people aren't widgets. So there is some you know, you still have to have rules about how to run a group and all this other stuff. But there, it, it was that that to me was a really big relief, uh, like a really big relief. I don't know if the teams know how big it really was to me, but it was. Um, so our next steps are what we're thinking about doing is establishing a man of war center at Columbia at CUIMC. And, and basically, we came up with three sort of goals about what we wanted to do. And one is just to continue to care for the research. Like, we'd like to do an RCT. Um, and that's really important if this is really going to be considered evidence-based. It's just important to do that. Um, perhaps with partnerships with VAs um, or partnerships with other people that we would train who have access to veterans and agree to participate in our study. 
And uh, participating in our study means using our protocol and the way we say to do it, allowing people to be randomized. We would come up with an appropriate control. It might even be a weight, a time control, um, being trained by us, being um, certified by us that they are doing our protocol. And perhaps in, in that kind of scenario, we might even do the assessments now that everybody's getting so used to Zoom and stuff. Like we could probably do this, the assessments, but we would want to have clinical backup. Um, another thing that we've been asked to do a lot is to train others in the protocol. Um, our first foray into training was training some path centers. We learned a lot from that. Um, and we made some, a lot of additions to the manual, people, things that didn't um, happen. And so PATH is coming out with some sort of course that people can take. Um, but I liken that to, um, if you wanted to learn how to do motivational interviewing, there's a lot of stuff you can do on the internet, but it doesn't mean that you're officially trained and you're doing motivational interviewing. So I think that even with this, I think there is a need to have people be supervised in the same way you can read a book on CBT or you could go really take a course and learn it really well. And like, you know what I mean? So we're, we're going to start um, training, other, training others more intensively. Um, we have been training a group in Israel online. Um, but with Zoom, it's not online. They, they're live. Um, dissemination of the manual. Um, establish, looking at more about how to get horses prepared for it. Um, we, you know, we were lucky, but that's not an area we knew that much about. We were just very lucky working with Bergen County, but there is a lot of interest in um, giving horses careers and how do you select a horse. Um, we're aware that not every horse is good for this. I mean, the horse I had as a child would never, <laughs> I mean, he was scary. I mean, he, there's no way this horse could have done that. So, and just preparing the horses from when you do it, like practicing with them. You don't want horses who kick people, you know, all this. So there is some preparation stuff. And then the thing that we're starting now is looking at adapting this protocol for a different population. Um, we're pilot, we're gonna be piloting it and adaptation of it for anxious youth. Because, um, and it's, I don't think it's gonna take that much adaptation but a lot of the things that we noticed in terms of emotional regulation, communication, feelings of competency, feelings of self-esteem and agency would be some, and doing it in a group setting um, would be something that seems completely applicable to that population. And so, and so we're, we're, we're looking into that. Um, yeah, there's one other thing I wanted to say, but I don't remember what it was. But I mean, I was pleasantly surprised, like really shocked <laughs> that mm -hmm. that that it did it did work out so well. I mean, I think that oh, this is what I was going to say. The one thing that really struck me, I don't know why I didn't put it on the slide, is you know when you're working in a mental health setting or just anything where there's there's a, a treatment going on. And you say you see people sitting around the waiting room and they're waiting to go to the group therapy or the group anger management. Like nobody looks happy to be there, right? Nobody is there. That is not the case in this. Um, people would look forward to the session. I mean, they would come in and say, oh, I was thinking about this all week. Like I'm always looking forward to Monday. I have never seen somebody do that in a group. Um, like it was, it was pretty interesting. Um, so, you know, that's, that's where we are. So I'll stop here. Oh my gosh. So great hearing from you, Dr. Fisher. You know, I think one of the most groundbreaking parts of what you guys have done is you have manualized it, you've documented it and you've published it. And you're right that so many anecdotal stories, so many different team models, so many different things, but to be able to have the protocols that you have and that you're sharing and that you've spent so much time focusing on, but really measuring, you know, the fact that, you know, 
their their cap scores decrease so significantly that's huge you know um it, that's hard to do in any type of therapy the fact that it's so tolerant and, and acceptable with such a low dropout you know i mean what 30 to 40 percent of veterans typically drop out of traditional therapies um you know the social and emotional piece the you know, emotional regulation, the self-confidence, all of those things that are those intangibles that can be really hard to measure. And we've all talked about in the industry for years to have you buy in and really start to put some, um, you know, some facts behind it and some research behind it. We're just really grateful in the industry. I mean, one, um, of the yeah. that, one of the things that I noticed myself, um, and I think Jody and Deborah can speak to this as well, is People look different at the end. Yeah. They just look different. They were standing up straighter. They felt competent. And we had this guy say to us, you know, when we started out, the horses look so big that these aren't very big horses, are they? <laughs> I mean, even just, it was just really strange. And sometimes like in the opening circle or the closing circle, we were videotaping everything. I was like watching everything. They would say stuff like you're thinking, did somebody tell him to say that? I mean, it was like being in a movie or something. It was really strange. Like, I, I wouldn't believe it. That, you know, no one ever took selfies of themselves on the couch with me, you know, in my office. But boy, they'd come and take pictures with those horses. And Jody and I had done some some work together. And Jody, you can say to that. I mean, we would take people out and, and just you're right, just after 20 minutes, all of a sudden that person's breathing slower. And, and I think all of us see that. Jody, do you have anything to add to that? You or Deborah to, to kind of jump in here? No, nope. you guys on the spot. <laughs> just put you guys on the spot. Don't worry about it. But you're absolutely right. I mean, um, you know, if anybody has questions here, um, you know, certainly Yuval will take a deep dive into the research and the, the uh, really what it means that the functional and structural changes mean, you know, what is actually, you know, the caudate pruning and, and all of those really interesting, you know, parts that came from the fMRI. I mean, that is really huge in the industry. But you know, again, what you what Man of War really showed us was that um, it's acceptable, it's tolerable, it's you know really embraced, and um, in the community can buy in. And one thing that was very funny when we were first looking at these programs, and Yvonne and I went around to a few programs, mm. we would come back and we were being in such a good mood. Uh, right, we just would. And I remember I was driving home with my husband. And I was saying, Dave, you know, I think this really could work. <laughs> I, you know, because we would just be like this. He goes, prudent, you don't have PTSD. Yeah. He goes, yeah. He goes, it would be bad if you didn't feel good, if you felt awful after going. But, you know, so what? You feel good. You know, but he said we were happy. It, it I had a veteran ask me the other day if um, we, he could do a study on measuring why we all like the smell of a barn. You know, we joke and say it's aromatherapy, but he was like, that would be a great research study. I just walk in, I'm like, you know, <laughs> so you're right. You're, you're right. There are so many pieces to this. Um, but also at the end, we talked about, yeah. At the end, the people, because I, I did exit interviews with a lot of people, right. they didn't, they wish it could go on, right? And so I said, well, you know, we asked, was it too long, too short? So they don't say, oh, it's too short. They wanted to go on. And so I would say to them, well, if we had told you at the beginning that it was going to be a, a 10 week program, a 12 week program, they, would you do it? And they said, no. And I said, well, we do have something called informants that we can't just change them. <laughs> so, so, you know, basically, yeah, I mean, people liked it and they did look forward to it. But that's really relevant too. And, and that might be next steps also. Is, is what does, you know, graduating from man of war, you know, point one and then manage for point two, or, you know, what, what is that continuity of care and how is that offered? So that could be really something interesting, you know, that probably a lot of us who run programs or, or work with um, clients on the ground might, you know, see that, yeah, why, why do they, why does this get people to come? What do you think? I, I, I think there is this, I think there is something about being around them. I do. I think it's this. I think it's everything. Yeah. 
I just I just wanted to say, uh, since you invited us to say something, yeah. so, um, I did just want to say that um, it was really interesting as a practitioner to be involved in a research study, because although I see changes and have seen changes before, it was so rewarding to get the evidence that we got and the feedback that we got that absolutely correlated to what Prudence was saying about their, even their physical appearance and everything, but then you also had the data to, you know, that, that supported it too, because I think those of us that are doing this work, we've seen things that have changed. We've seen people move forward. We've, we've witnessed it and witnessed that, but it was just so rewarding to also see the evidence, you know, in the black and white, and then just visually seeing the confirmation that the black and white information was lining up. It was very rewarding. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I just, one of the things I would say is I wish that we had added some additional measures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And done this more systematically. I mean, in the next study, I would do that. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to say that um, um, Yuval is going to be talking about the neuro neuroimaging um, study. And Deborah and I are also going to be in North Carolina, and we're going to dig into um, into into how we manage the process and work the, with the groups. Deborah, you want to add something? Right, because the the thing that was really interesting too is you know the team approach, and uh, it was interesting when Prudence was talking about the second session that seemed you know chaotic and a lot going on that we certainly uh, concur with too in our experience, but. There's uh, so many aspects that there's sort of like a relearning for the mental health professional and also for the equine person in the sense of, you know, if you're used to, if, if your uh, role is usually, you know, horsemanship and, and training people with horses, you know, we both, uh, both of our roles, we have to sort of relearn, you know, how to do that in a way that facilitates the client coming to their own conclusions. So um, it's interesting because we've had opportunities, as Prudence said, to um, you know, train some other people in the, in the protocol and we had been swimming in it for years. So then now you're going to teach it and the nuances that we kind of had been swimming in for years were things that we didn't realize really needed to be stated because they were things that we had gotten into a rhythm of how to do. So I think what we've been able to do now and what we hope to do at the conference too, for anyone that's looking to you know do the protocol is to you know give a, a little insight into what those uh, nuances are in your team relationship and how um how the the whole thing even though it's a a structure as prudence said uh experiential within a structure we are moving with the clients as they're moving to and where they are so it's definitely client driven even though we are doing it in a, in a structure and that's like a really interesting dance to to be in and to be in in a team uh, approach as opposed to a therapist who's in your office you know working on your own so that's what we hope to give some insight uh into uh and some other things i'm sure jody that you might want to add if anybody's interested in you know what might be available at the conference yeah well i mean we can also it sounds like that there is an interest in um you know, how we selected horses and sort of our thoughts on it. I, I definitely have my own thoughts on it. Um, so we can, uh, you know, maybe we could dig into that in North Carolina too, might be kind of fun. Yeah, I know one of the things that our team is really sensitive to is, is you know, the, the burnout, compassion fatigue, the resilience of the team, you know, what if, um, you know, someone yeah, yes. away and now yeah. you've had that amazing bond, you know, you know, with my, my team, I can just give a look or they can give me a look and we know what we're saying. But how then what you guys have created is such an interesting thing is, is that it's standardized. So really, you know, of course that co-facilitation and that treatment team rapport is so important, but because you said it's replicable and it's standardized, that that's really hopeful because, you know, there's only one of me or one of my ESs. Well, now there's 10 of us or 20 of us and we're all doing the same thing with the same results. Um, but yeah, the compassion fatigue, our, our team talks about a lot as, you know, what about the horses and suitability? So certainly would love to hear more and maybe that's the next webinar <laughs> other than the conference.
But we've gone over time and really want to respect everybody's time. Thank you all so much for actually staying the extra minutes. I mean, just fascinating and more to come. Um, of course, the recording is available on HHRF's um, YouTube channel. Um, please check out the Man of War website. The, the documents are there. It's a great read. I promise it's not a bedtime read. It's definitely an early morning cup of coffee, maybe two cups <laughs> of coffee. 